Midnight, in the woods of northern Minnesota, a deep rustling in the trees reminds you that you're not alone. Shh. We're stalking a scientist, somewhere in the dark, a researcher in the field lies in wait. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Weller. I'm an entomologist. Go ahead, stick your hat on. Time for us to go. Today, we're carefully tracking the life of a scientist, specifically an entomologist. We'll find out what Susan does and why she does it. Tonight, she's taking her son Christopher into the field to help her. That's it. Oh, good night. Entomology, the study of bugs. Susan studies moths. What makes them tick? What makes them fly? What makes them all a family? Susan's trying to put together a moth family tree. All moths are related. Technically speaking, they are the order of Lepidoptera. But what's the difference between moths and butterflies? Well, I guess I would say that a quick way to tell is that butterflies have clubbed antennae and they make a chrysalis, not a pupa. But Really, it's more complicated than that, and the best way to think about the difference between butterflies and moths is that butterflies are day-flying moths. Susan's research is about moths and their families. That means they share certain characteristics, just like you and your family probably look alike. You might all wear glasses or have big ears. One way that Susan learns about moth family trees is by studying their DNA. But the first step is to catch the moths. Since they're most active at night, Susan spends a lot of time under the stars, capturing them in the dark of the moon. Susan has a simple way of catching moths. Since moths are attracted to light, she just uses an ultraviolet light to make a white bedsheet glow in the dark. Then she can capture just the moths she needs for her study. What a nice one. Susan freezes some of the moths soon after capture. It keeps them fresh for the trip to her lab at the University of Minnesota for DNA testing. It used to be that scientists studied organisms like moths only by observing their characteristics, wings, antenna, stuff like that. And we still can and do observe their physical characteristics, but now we can also examine the invisible part, their genes. And to do this, we have to do something that, if you like looking at their physical characteristics, it's tough. You gotta grind them up. Mm, nothing like good old homemade Lepidoptera juice. Oh, well, we don't need to grind up the whole moth, just, just a leg or an antenna. Susan's lab work is with the very tiniest parts of living beings, their genetic blueprint. Technology has given Susan a brand new way to construct moth family trees through DNA. And what we're trying to do is find a gene that controls a particular trait in the moth. It's kind of like looking for a trait that controls how you curl your tongue. Now, lots of people can curl their tongue. I'm afraid I can't very well, but, well, here's my best shot. Comparing moth genes and moth structures helps scientists like Susan figure out how moths are related and how they are changing. The moths that aren't frozen are carefully mounted for collections housed at the University of Minnesota. That way, other scientists can use them for research. And scientists in training can learn from them too. Collections are incredibly important. Each specimen is like a book in the library. It's um, a little time capsule of biology full of structure and DNA for us to study. We've seen Susan in the field collecting moths and a little of what she does in the lab. But my favorite place is the museum, where you can see all the moths and butterflies collected by scientists. You know, studying bugs is really fun. 